So hi everyone, uh, I'm a Mastermind, which is obviously not my <laughs> real name. Uh, well, I'm an application developer at Scala. I'm with uh, Hazan, uh, also a developer, a blockchain developer, and Donovan. Um, both are developer at Scala. We are very excited to be with you today uh, to present our project and how we use IPFS technologies uh, within our ecosystem. Uh, the presentation will take uh, place in three parts. First, uh, Donovan will introduce our lib IPFS library, uh, which allows us to use uh, IPFS within our uh, applications. Then Hezam will present in a concrete way uh, how we are planning to use IPFS to secure our blockchain against potential attacks. And finally, I will present some other uses of IPFS uh, within our project. But first of all, let me introduce Scala and who we are and what we do. So our first goal is to keep privacy as a priority in everything we do. Uh, this is why we forked from Monero uh, in the first place and provide an opaque blockchain, untraceable payments, unlinkable transactions, and blockchain analysis resistance. Uh, our vision is to distribute wealth for everyone and every device. Uh, we want to be the people's coin. And to achieve this goal, we focus on implementing solutions that are mobile friendly and uh, very energy efficient. Uh, there are about 4 billion mobile devices in the world and we want to make sure that uh, our ecosystem takes that into account. We also take a lot of time to improve the user experience uh, so that our applications are, can be used easily by anyone. And finally, um, one of our goals is to solve real world problems, obviously, in a way that is economically viable for the project and to sustain our growth. Um, so now I'm gonna leave, uh, I'm gonna let Donovan for the next part. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, one of the goals of our project is, has always been to be as decentralized as we can possibly make it. We don't ever want to get into a position where we are called the central authority of the chain where we can manipulate things. And when we started looking at ways of securing our blockchain, uh, we knew that IPFS would really align with that vision. And uh, I believe that has led us to become one of the first projects that's using IPFS uh, in a way that can actually impact the consensus of the blockchain in the way that Aizam will be explaining it in the, uh, in the next section. <clears throat> Another goal of our project, like it was just mentioned, was uh, to have ease of use. We want to make it as simple as possible for anyone to get involved. And for that reason, we knew that our IPFS integration needs to be part of our core package and not require any additional dependencies to be installed or uh, any additional downloads and registrations all over the place. So with that in mind, we explored our options. Our main daemon that runs on client computers, on servers with exchanges, that's built in C and C++. However, IPFS is written in Go. And at the time we started looking at this, which was uh, probably more than a year ago now, um, there were no implementations to use IPFS directly from C++ without having a standalone IPFS running and using HTTP APIs. <clears throat> so uh, one of the good things with Go is obviously that you can link Go libraries into C++ code. And that made it really a possibility for us to take IPFS and pull it into our main daemon and from there lib IPFS as we call it was born. Our initial integration with IPFS was actually was quite low level if I could if I could call it that. Our library would set up initialize and run IPFS from uh, within our own Go uh, code. Uh, what I mean by that is it we use a lot of the startup logic that you can find in the standard IPFS uh, daemon itself and we ran that inside of our library. Uh, what was great about that is it allows us a great degree of control of what we start and what we don't start with the we disabled at the beginning the HTTP API because we didn't need it. 
The other reason for that is cryptocurrency exchanges typically don't want anything other than the core network tools because they don't want the overhead, especially the smaller exchanges that don't really have a Binance kind of uh, setup to, to operate these chains on. So the other great thing about integrating on that level was that we could expose different IPFS features directly to our daemon by wrapping that feature inside of a simple C++ to go call. And the first version of this test uh, was done in the fourth major revision of our software that was about probably a year, year and a half ago. And that fetched some of the seed nodes and some of the core network data that it needs to start up from IPFS. And uh, to our surprise, almost no issues apart from some, some users that ran a very restrictive network setup. Some of those calls were blocked, but other than that, it, it really worked really well. Uh, fast forward a few months later, uh, we reviewed our integration and we found that dependency management in the long run is going to be really, really tricky. This was a time when Go was in that awkward space of not really having an official dependency management system like it does now with Go modules. Um, some projects were using Go vendor, I believe IPFS had GX and uh, some other ones just had none to speak of. And it became obvious that because we had such a low level integration that any changes in the IPFS core would disproportionately impact our integration which obviously takes time away from our main focus being the, the cryptocurrency. So to overcome this, uh, we recently took a bit of a higher level approach. We still, need a, we still need the Go wrapper around IPFS so that we can start the daemon from C++. Uh, but instead of doing all the work, initializing the network and connecting and all of that, we package a compiled IPFS binary uh, and embed that inside of our library with a tool uh, named escape or ESC. And uh, when the daemon starts up, it calls a function, it extracts that package, starts the IPFS daemon, and we can communicate then using the HTTP API, which works perfectly fine. Uh, what's nice about this approach again, is we can add command line flags to our C++ code to disable that functionality for exchanges, which keeps them happy. We still achieve the goal of not having additional software to be installed by our users. And we, we get a win out of that so that we don't need to worry about dependencies and we can just take advantage of all the new IPFS functionality as it becomes available by just repackaging that binary into our code. Um, so that's, a, that's an overview of how we do this on a low level. And I'll pass on to Hazem now, which will explain how all of this comes together to really secure our blockchain. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm going to start by actually proposing a question. Um, why do we need additional security for the blockchain? Is it uh, not supposed to be like inherently secure without the any third party applications or implementation? Uh, I'd say it's a pretty uh, difficult question to answer, but uh, it's not a necessity for a coin like Bitcoin or something like that, uh, because they have a lot of miners and nodes and all that stuff to ward off most of the common attacks. Uh, our problem is pretty niche and our solution is quite niche too, mostly applicable to projects that don't enjoy the same level of uh, decentralization such as that of Bitcoin. So um, before we jump in, um, jump into how we are aiming to solve the problem, Let's uh, take a look at some common network level attacks against the blockchain in particular. Uh, distributed denial of service attacks. They are pretty common on blockchain these days. Since if you're a small project, especially with not a lot of peers hosting the chain, it's pretty easy to take out the nodes that are good to cause a lot of havoc. And uh, the next type of attack I would say is uh, cyber attacks. And recently Monero had this uh, very specific attack where a bunch of nodes pretended to be honest and try to find origins of certain transactions, which was uh, pretty complex, and at the end was able to cause a lot of problems too. <clears throat> now, uh, moving to the main kind of attack that causes uh, the most amount of problems in the industry is 51 percent And uh, if a dishonest player uh, has enough compute to overpower the majority of the network, they would be able to rewrite histories, basically. Mostly to spend the same amount of coin multiple times. I'm, I'm sure you've all heard about this issue before. This can be devastating, especially for 
medium to small size projects and uh, it, caused, it could cause huge amounts of losses for exchanges and so on. And uh, there are quite a lot of existing methods that work towards protecting the blockchain against attacks, specifically 51% attacks. And uh, we'll, look at, we'll take a look at uh, two of them in brief. Um, one of the best in the market, uh, which a lot of coins actively use, is uh, deep, uh, delayed proof of work uh, by Komodo. It's actually pretty smart as well. They use the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain to store arbitrary data, in this case, block hashes uh, of a network that uh, Komodo is trying to protect. And it is regarded as uh, one of the go to solutions for a lot of projects at the moment, uh, especially popular ones like Linux Square or Fire Chain use, uh, delayed proof of work for security. And uh, another solution that is also pretty popular in recent times is just put a regression checkpoint, where basically they just don't allow uh, any kind of reorganizations past the uh, end blocks in the past. This actually could cause a lot of issues uh, as they already had in mind, but uh, there's no other option to protect against it that could uh, you know, devastate the chain. So now that we've taken a look at some of the existing solutions, let's uh, take a look at our solution, which is called uh, DRD. And in essence, it works a lot like uh, KMD's great proof of work, but instead of using the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain to store arbitrary data, we use IPFS since it's a lot cheaper, faster, and more reliable. And uh, even though Bitcoin has a lot of compute and security behind it, it is still vulnerable to 51% attacks. Uh, so if somebody has a lot of compute, they can overpower the chain and then you know take majority and rewrite as soon as So um, in DRD, there are essentially uh, certain nodes that uh, consistently take block caches, which are uh, you know blocks in the network, and then publishes those block hashes along with the um, height and some other parameters onto IPFS and then IP, IPNS so that uh, the client uh, blockchain demons can resolve it and get the checkpoint and then add it to their local databases. Uh, and then the way we pick these uh, node maintainers is by a yearly election that this gives people a chance to be a part of this uh, second layer network. And also decentralizes some of the power that these nodes have because uh, they have a lot of power uh, Come to think of. And uh, they're also incentivized with tokens from the network, so they don't have an incentive to cyber attack us. <laughs> and then uh, about 25% of the block rewards right now goes to node maintenance on our network. So uh, essentially, this is a solution in very, very simple terms. And uh, I've actually written a simple web application to so show this in action. Just a uh, side note uh, right now, we're in private beta, looking to move to uh, public in the next few weeks. and. Uh, I think uh, mastermind could show the thing over there. <laughs> yep, this is the thing I was talking about. So basically, uh, you can see three nodes here. They are taking uh, block hashes from Scalar's blockchain right now and then uh, adding that to IPFS so that other nodes in the network could uh, fetch these hashes from here and add it as a permanent block so that there cannot be a reorganization uh, past this block. And it's pretty cool. And, uh, and I should say, the latest update, the point A, uh, it is really fast. I mean, like IPNS resolutions used to take like you know, two, three minutes on at most. Now it takes like 10, 15 seconds at most. And it's really cool because, you know, it uh, avoids a lot of DDoS back and all that stuff. So yeah, I'll uh, give back control over to Mastermind. And thanks uh, for the opportunity and hope you all have a nice day. All right. Thank you, Reza. Um, so I will now introduce, um, uh, to conclude our presentation, some other users of IPS, uh, IPFS in our project. Uh, first, our, we our official website is hosted on IPFS, uh, which makes, makes it uh, decentralized, scalable, and less expensive to maintain. Uh, you can access it at scalaproject.io if you, if you want more information about that about what we, we build. Um, in addition, we have also developed a proof of work algorithm uh, that makes mining on mobile devices uh, possible. So we have uh, recently released uh, Scala Miner, which is a mobile application that allows mining on any uh, Android device. Uh, the application provides a detailed dashboard to track all the mining activities. Uh, as well as two layers of temperature control to protect your device from overheating. We use IPNS uh, DNS link uh, address using IPFS gateways to fetch the list of mining pools. 
which ensures uh, maximum service availability. And you can download the application at uh, mobileminer.scalaproject.io. And finally, we are currently working on Phantom, uh, which is in development. Uh, it's a content delivery, uh, distributed content delivery network, a CDN. Uh, it's going to allow, allow us to offer uh, our users a secure and des decentralized file hosting, leveraging our IPFS notary nodes and obviously our mobile ecosystem. So that's it for uh, for Scala. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them uh, at the end of the, the meetup. Thank you, everyone.